So we're going to be talking today, of course, about uh, cognitive therapy for psychosis for Jenner, so I'm not being introduced. Um, if you didn't get handouts, there are uh, handouts out on the registration table out there. And if you haven't given me an email address, which will you, in other words, if you haven't gotten a confirmation email for this, make sure on the table that has the books you sign up and give me an email address because there's going to be a lot of other handouts that go out by email. And I want to make sure you get them all. Um, and I want to say just a few words about why it's a, a, a very practical and kind of common sense approach for psychosis. Um, and, it, and it's because cognitive therapy is, is a pretty down-to-earth kind of approach that it really works pretty well when you're dealing with something that uh, involves kind of like far-out states of mind, like a lot of psychotic experience. It uses pretty simple ideas and concepts, um, but its way of thinking is, is really consistent with um, ideas from the science of complex systems. They're otherwise known as nonlinear dynamics. So while it uses really simple approaches, um, it's, it's also not simplistic. And it often has really specific ideas about what people can do about, uh, it, it has re really uh, some ideas about what people can do towards recovery. It doesn't just kind of like talk about that being possible, but helps people develop a roadmap of what they can do to take back control of their lives. It's also a, a well-researched therapy. Um, there's at least 23 randomized studies that have been done that shows that cognitive therapy for psychosis has uh, significant positive effects. And it's on Oregon's list of evidence-based practice, um, which is also helpful. On that list, it's called cognitive therapy for schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. And knowing about that research um, base is really important because a lot of people still have the idea that psychotherapy can't be helpful for people with psychosis um, or people with schizophrenia. And so when you're trying to introduce it, it's helpful to know that this isn't just an idea, but this is an idea that's been tested many times and shown to be an effective approach. It was developed more in, in the UK and other, some other European countries, and it's still kind of like relatively unknown or not practiced that much in the United States, perhaps because we've somewhat got a biological basis, a biological bias in, in this country. So what I'm going to be doing today is more like kind of an in-depth introduction to cognitive therapy for psychosis. I mean, if, if, if it's something you really decide that, um, I mean, you can get ideas out of what we talk about here that you can apply to your practice, it will be very helpful. But if you really want to learn the approach and, and practice it as a regular thing, you're going to want to do more studying. Like in, in, the, in England, um, there are kind of like introductory uh, course to try to get people practicing cognitive therapy for psychosis is 80 hours. Um, now, obviously, we don't have that kind of training in Oregon, but through a combination of things like reading some of the books that are out there, and there are samples on a table out there of a lot of the different books, um, doing that, and then maybe talking with other people that are interested, um, colleagues of yours can be really helpful, maybe form a study group, that's what we do in Eugene, we have a study group of people that are interested. Um, and also, I'm, I'm hoping there's going to be more trainings going on in, in Oregon. Um, like, maybe some agency, maybe some of you that are here can get your agency to, to sponsor a more extended training, and if, if you find this interesting, and maybe even get some of the people from the UK over here for a more extended um, kind of training, that would be a really interesting, I think. And one other thing that you might want to know about is in December, on December 4th, I'm going to repeat this workshop at Portland State University. And then on December 5th, have a, a training on uh, the cognitive approach to dealing with psychosis and trauma, when trauma is involved. So I hope some of you will consider coming to that. So kind of get started, since a lot of people have kind of like been trained in the, the approach that you know, medication is what you do for psychosis, and 
and that's been pretty much the, the dominant model. I want to say something about the relationship between cognitive therapy for psychosis and medications. Now, most of the studies I was talking about are studies of people that were also taking medications, but they had a lot of symptoms that medications didn't control, which is actually pretty common uh, you know, with people with psychosis, that the medications are only partly effective or for some of them ineffective. So, so cognitive therapy was helpful with people with those kind of issues. But there was, there was already been one study done on people that were just starting to have psychotic symptoms. They were considered, you know, they hadn't required hospitalization or anything yet, but they were starting to have some psychotic symptoms, and they just used cognitive therapy with no medications, and they had good results with that group. So, so the typical client for cognitive therapy for psychosis, oh, my sound going in and out? Okay. Um, the typical client is on medication but has significant symptoms. That, I'm not sure what's happening. Significant symptoms that the medications aren't controlling. Um, and it's, uh, it's also common, kind of though, as a result of the therapy that maybe people can end up using uh, fewer medications. And that can be important because there is data out there that says that our clients in the mental health system, public mental health system, are typically dying 25 years earlier than average and often from medication-related kinds of conditions. And so anything we can do to help people be healthy with lower doses of medications is helpful. And cognitive therapy has also been used commonly with people that refuse medications and there's no research studies on that, but there's quite a few case studies that show it's been effective and for people like that, at least at times. Um, then I want to also say a few things about the relationship between cognitive therapy and the, the whole medical model of, of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. And when I use the phrase medical model, I'm going to be talking about the more extreme version of it. That's kind of like the model that the head of the American Psychiatric Association referred to when he said that We've kind of unfortunately shifted from the biopsychosocial model to more of a bio, bio, bio model. Uh, I mean, the mental health system has kind of like had this model of schizophrenia as a lifelong disease that's caused by genetics or some kind of brain disease. And there's really no medical model for how schizophrenia, once it's established, could go away. But we actually know from looking at outcome studies that people do recover. And even people who appear the worst um, most often recover, at least somewhat, with, with some percentage recovering fully. The World Health Organization just recently came out with a study that even for people that were still ill after 15 years, when they looked at them for 25 years, after 10 more years, quite a few people had recovered. So just because somebody's been in the system for 15 years doesn't mean they're doomed to not recover either. So really a lot of the statistics about schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders is really way off from what the medical model would have you expect. Like if the medical model was accurate, you'd expect that recovery rates would be way higher now than when medications were first introduced. And you'd expect that recovery rates would be much higher in the developed countries where we have lots of medication than in third world countries where they don't use much. And when people did recover, you'd expect them to be the ones that did the best jobs of staying on their medication. But instead what you find is that recovery rates haven't gone up and sometimes appear to be going down. There's two World Health Organization studies that show that recovery is almost twice as likely in third world countries than in the more developed countries. And long-term outcome studies usually show that those that fully recovered are more, most often off medication, such as a recent 15-year um, outcome study that showed that the recovery rate was eight times higher among people who'd gotten off medications. Now, I'm not going to try to go into a lot more detail about what should or shouldn't be the role of medications. I mean, that's a whole other workshop in itself. There is a book out in the lobby that's called Healing, Healing Schizophrenia, Using Medication Wisely, and it really goes into that subject in depth if people are interested in that. But I'm just trying to make the point that if we're going to really try to help people recover, 
we need to step back and take a broader look at what's going on um, than just the medical model. Um, and we, we really need a much broader look. And the cognitive approach to psychosis um, does take a much wider approach than the medical model version. And unlike the medical model, it has real specific ideas about how people recover. It sees people as capable of collaborating in their own recovery. I'm still not sure what's going on with this thing. Um, so many people learning about um, cognitive therapy for psychosis for the first time find that learning about the different way of thinking about psychosis is harder than learning the actual uh, steps of the therapy. So. Um, you might notice as I'm talking today that some of the things I'm saying will really kind of like contradict what you've heard before about psychosis. And I just encourage you to kind of like, um, you know, take in what I'm saying and um, notice what your questions are. And then when we do have time for questions, ask some of them because it's really good to um, look at what some of some of uh, these issues are because, like I said, that's some of the hardest part is, is learning the new ways of thinking about it. So I just want to kind of like start by talking a little about what the heck is psychosis. Um, and this is a definition from a, from a medical dictionary, and it's uh, a severe mental disorder with or without organic damage, characterized by derangement of personality and loss of contact with reality. And, causing deterioration of normal social functioning. Well, really the essence of that um, definition is that it has to do with being out of touch with reality. I mean, derangement basically means uh, disorientation. Um, so, so essentially it's about loss of contact with reality. So I, I have a question for you guys. Um, how many of you are totally in touch with reality? <laughs> Okay, so we, we've got one person there, I see. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a like grandiose delusion. <laughs> um, but since, since none of us are really um, in, totally in touch with reality, does that mean we should all say that we're at least a bit psychotic? Yeah. Um, the cognitive perspective is that we're all at least a bit out of touch with reality, and, and nobody's totally out of touch. Everybody's at least in touch with something. And we just define psychosis as the point where that out-of-touchness begins to appear severe. Um, or, you know, maybe it puts us in conflict with the wrong people. So it's a matter of degree. That we all have these kind of problems, but um, that, that it's a matter of degree. And also, it's an interesting question. Who judges what being in touch with reality is? If none of us are flawlessly in touch with reality, how can we judge... Um, Who's out of touch with it? I mean, sometimes people are out of touch with what we think of as reality, but maybe they're more in touch with what's actually going on at some other level. Cognitive therapy kind of like sees it all on a continuum, like where all mental problems have some kind of out of touch with reality component. So like a person with anorexia who thinks they're fat, you know, this is sort of an out of touch with reality idea. Or a person who has a panic attack and thinks that they're dying or um, a depressed mother who's taking care of her children under very difficult circumstances, and yet she thinks she's worthless. Um, psychosis is just distinguished by the extreme and socially unacceptable nature of the interpretations that are made. And, and also, the cognitive therapist doesn't have to assume that he or she is totally in touch with reality, because the focus instead is on a collaborative investigation, you know, a dialogue where the client has something helpful to contribute, as well as the therapist. Um, dialogue's one thing that usually breaks down by the time somebody gets kind of far out enough to be labeled psychotic. Um, and that breakdown in dialogue also happens on a continuum. Like when our difficulties in being in touch with reality are just little, um, they just are kind of like little errors, and we have no trouble talking with our colleagues about it. You know, we, well, we might have had a little bit of poor information, or maybe we were just having a little bit of denial or whatever, but we can talk with other people about it and joke about it and that kind of thing. When our problems are kind of like medium, 
like maybe we're starting to have you know, some kind of anxiety problem. At that point, it might be hard to talk to some people about it, but we can still find trusted friends to talk about it. And if we want, we can you know, hire a therapist, and the therapist will talk with us as equals kind of about our problem and you know, work through it with us, not be too judgmental. Um, but by the time we've got a problem that gets severe, like what gets labeled psychosis, well, by then we've probably lost most of our friends and our family thinks we're crazy and doesn't really want to talk to us about what we're thinking. And typically, if we go to a mental health worker, that person also doesn't want to talk about our ideas, about what's going on. They maybe want you to talk about well, what your mental illness is, or something like that, but they don't want to talk about your specific concerns, beliefs, and experiences. You know, schizophrenia experiences have been defined by a lot of the mental health system as being non-understandable, and there's no sh this notion you shouldn't talk to a disease. Uh, don't talk too much about the hallucinations, that will just encourage them. Those kind of beliefs are out there. And so the, the, the opportunity for dialogue gets kind of cut off. So the problem is when we're really doing well, we easily get the social support we need to continue doing well. And we get the dialogue that helps us sort through things. But when we're doing poorly, we, we lose social support and the kind of ability to have dialogue about what's going on. So what you see is kind of a circular thing going on, where something that's an effect can also become a cause. I mean, getting isolated can actually be kind of a cause of psychosis, especially being isolated around a lot of people. Like they found that the worst thing is people who live in an urban area, but they live alone in an area where most people are in couples and, and families and stuff. Um, but being psychotic itself often um, causes isolation. Um, for one thing, the symptoms are often cause people to isolate, but then often people pull back from the person um, who's having the symptoms and don't want to talk to them. Even if they're willing to be in the same room, they don't want to talk about their experience. So this pattern of an effect also being a cause or this whole kind of circular dynamic is, is something I mentioned before, nonlinear dynamics. or. Um, it's basically positive feedback loops that can become kind of a self-organizing pattern. A key part of cognitive therapy for psychosis is looking for these kind of dynamics in a person's life, where um, we're going to talk about it later under the part of the, the talk called uh, the formulation. It's an idea in cognitive therapy. We'll talk about that. So rather than seeing what's going on as kind of like a mysterious illness, um, what you're basically seeing is understandable chains of cause and effect, even if they're vicious circles of cause and effect. And the mental problems um, that result um, often have a lot to do with this breakdown in dialogue that we're talking about, but cognitive therapy is about an opportunity to start restoring that kind of dialogue so that a person isn't too dominated by unhelpful thoughts and emotions. Um, the cognitive model, I see you're probably familiar with it already, but it basically emphasizes that what people need is rational behavior, balanced thinking, that kind of stuff. And rationality really means just taking a variety of sides into account. And it's something that basically emerges out of dialogue. In dialogue, you have different views, different perspectives. And so that can be, dialogue can be between two people or it can be internal dialogue where internally a person's willing to weigh different sides. Um, healthy internal dialogue is more likely when there's also external dialogue, healthy external dialogue. So the idea in cognitive therapy is that the cure for dysfunctional thoughts and emotions is not trying to suppress the, the, the irrational thought or the disruptive emotion, but it's trying to bring in the other side and look at both sides together. Um, now, it's, it can be a little misleading to focus too much on balance because I, you know, I think overall the mental health system overemphasizes balance. Um, but I think what's more helpful to look at it is kind of like that we operate best kind of on the edge of balance. And I often illustrate this by, um, by like if you stand up perfectly balanced um, and then try to walk while not throwing your balance off at all, it's, pretty impossible. In order to walk, we have to be somewhat out of balance, but not too much. You don't want to fall on your face, but you also have to be somewhat out of balance. So 
Um, it's kind of like, could be seen as kind of a meta balance. And that's what happens in dialogue. In dialogue, you know, there's conversation, one side weighs in, the other side weighs in. It's not perfectly balanced, but it has kind of a moving quality. Um, you know, pretty much all of what we look at in terms of mental health problems have kind of like a, a too far out of balance kind of thing, where people swing from these different extremes that you see here. So uh, the one on the left here is uh, what kind of therapists call emotional reasoning, where basically a person thinks that, let's say they have a feeling of fear, and they pretty much just assume that means they're in danger. If I feel scared, then it's, it's terrible. I can't go there. Um, and of course, when people are caught in that kind of emotional reasoning, their life can get really messed up because they can't go anywhere that feels scary. So then they often swing to the other side and think, well, my emotion is my enemy. I need to get rid of this fear. How can I just block it out? They try to block it out in their mind, or they go try to get drugs to block out the fear. And those are two extremes. Whereas the cognitive idea is, is in the middle, is where we're more like what health is. It's like we're open to feeling our feelings and emotions, but we don't assume that they mean true, OK? So if you feel fear, it might mean you're in danger, or it might mean that um, it's just a feeling, and you have to decide whether it's accurate. If the fear is not, there's no, the danger isn't really that significant, you just kind of have to go on about your business. Now, I'm not sure how well you can see this next slide, but this is a picture I took on North Sister a couple of years ago. And as you might be able to tell, this part of the climb is just a little precarious. <laughs> um, my sister-in-law asked me how I could do things like climb, and she said, well, don't you have any fear of heights? And I told her, well, I wouldn't climb if I didn't have a fear of heights, because, you know, I, falling is bad. Um, but I also couldn't climb if I couldn't reassure myself that I know what I'm doing and I'm actually reasonably safe. Now, you can't see that there is a rope in there, but <laughs> it's part of what's going on. Um, so the fact that I'm open to a dialogue within myself between I can feel the fear, oh no, I might die here, okay, but what am I doing about it? How am I making sure I'm safe? That's really what healthy um, you know, emotional functioning is about. Now, one thing that kind of disrupts that dialogue can be trauma. You know, we know from brain studies that when a person's overly aroused, the part of their mind that evaluates danger is essentially shut down. Um, it's like, kind of like the brain just focuses on either, um, you know, flight or maybe fight or maybe freezing. But the problem is that, you know, our minds can get kind of trapped in that kind of mode. And that dialogue of evaluating danger can kind of like get shut down. And that results, what well, we all know about post-traumatic stress disorder and, and, and other sorts of emotional problems. But one of the problems that can result out of trauma is psychosis. And the idea that trauma can lead to psychosis is still considered controversial in, in a lot of quarters. But it's actually the research on it is very strong. And um, if, if you're kind of like still skeptical, I encourage you to email me for, I can send you this uh, summary of studies on trauma and psychosis. So if our goal is to have a trauma-informed system, then we really need to address uh, the fact that, that trauma can cause psychosis. That really need, is an important thing that needs to be addressed. And not only can psychosis uh, result from trauma, but research also shows that becoming psychotic can be traumatizing in itself. I mean, think about it. If you were to just become psychotic this afternoon, it'd probably mess up your life pretty significantly um, and would be traumatizing. And then an additional thing is that the reaction of other people to you once you become psychotic can also be traumatizing to you. Whether that's uh, maybe forced treatment or maybe it's just family and friends withdrawing from you and all of a sudden feeling you have no support. So just like cognitive therapy for normal emotional problems aims to you know, get that mental dialogue going where people can allow their feelings and thoughts, but not be dominated by them. You know, cognitive therapy for psychosis tries to do the same thing for what's known as psychotic symptoms. You're basically trying to get that inner dialogue going within the client again, where they're not just 
hearing the voice and believing it, but they're able to weigh, you know, what what they think um, and, and weigh both sides. Um, so um, I wonder if there's uh, any questions so far on what we talked about. Yeah. Too loud? Okay. Is this anybody? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
when, when you're referring to recovery because you get a broad definition. Right. A lot of the studies in recovery look at things like uh, social functioning, ability to work, have good social networks, be able to work, and also just not needing treatment, not needing the um, mental health system anymore. That's, that one's a little more controversial. But, um, I mean, obviously there are many people out there who've recovered in all those senses. Right. Um, and, um, most people would say the most important is to be able to recover your ability to function in the world, to have a you know, functional life and to uh, be able to not be disabled, to have you know, a positive <coughs> life with good social networks. But not necessarily having all their symptoms just you know, no longer be present. Yeah, but that, that, that's possible too. You know, and it doesn't necessarily have. But then another interesting thing that cognitive therapists look at is if you look at the general population of people that have never been in the psychiatric system, quite a few of them have what psychiatrists consider psychotic symptoms. I mean, hearing voices is not an unusual experience among people that haven't been in the mental health system. It's actually, um, there's more people that aren't in the mental health system who hear voices, according to a lot of studies, than people in the mental health system. And so, if you can get to the point where you have what might otherwise be considered a psychotic belief, but it no longer causes problems for you, then you know that's pretty much recovery. You know, you may be a little different than other people, but you know you're not impaired in any way. So it's not about making everybody totally normal. Um, we're, we're after alleviating distress. Um, anybody else right now, or should I move along? Okay, how many people ask questions? Are you able to hear the uh, questions? Yeah. No? Okay, well, we do have a mic. Maybe next time when we do questions, we'll have somebody try to pass around the mic and make that part a little easier. Um, also, I'd like to mention, we do have somebody shooting video, as you might have noticed, and somebody else taking pictures. So, um, is there anybody here that really doesn't want to uh, have your picture taken or be on the video? Okay. It looks like we're all right. Okay, that's good. Um, so I guess I'll, um, I'll, I'll just move along with this. Uh, so one of the key things, if you're going to do this kind of work, you have to believe that it's possible for it to work. And so one of the things that can undermine that is um, kind of a misconception about uh, the relationship between, I would think maybe between the, what, what is the brain and what is kind of like mental activity or the mind. And so we've got a kind of strong bias in our culture that if a disorder or problem can be associated uh, with, you know, possibly with brain chemistry or structure, then we assume that that means that a person needs a physical intervention to solve the problem, like medication. Now, it is true that people diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, for example, frequently, but not always, show brain differences compared to the average undiagnosed person. Um, and it's not clear where those come from. Uh, some, uh, it appears that some actually come from the medications that are given. And so a lot of the changes also uh, are the same changes found in people who've been traumatized. That in people who've been traumatized, a lot of those same changes that have been associated with schizophrenia are found. Um, but does that really mean that physical interventions like medication are the only thing that's going to be helpful once a person has that going on in their brain? Well, there is an alternative view, and that's that mental activity or brain behavior, what you do with your mind, actually changes your brain chemistry and eventually can even change brain structure itself. And that notion that you change your brain by what you do is known as neuroplasticity. Like, for example, they found that people meditate, like, say, 40, 40 minutes a day over a period of months, they actually create measurable changes in their brain structure, the part of their brain that controls impulses. Um, and that change in brain structure has also been fine for things as diverse as like uh, taxi driving or practicing piano or learning to juggle. 
Um, those are things that it's been, and it's, this whole notion is not really more mystical than the idea that how you use your muscles changes their structure. Um, but it's also very hopeful because um, while there might be structural changes that are associated with bad patterns like that we call mental illness, um, and we know that there's often physical changes that happen when a person goes through something like trauma like, you know, and then develops PTSD. It may also be possible for a person to reverse that by turning towards better habits. Um, and so that's part of what, of course, cognitive therapy is about. But if you take that perspective of neuroplasticity and that the brain changes as you think differently and do things differently, then it's, it's much more hopeful. So, so you have to have hope. And then what else? The most fundamental part of this kind of therapy is your relationship with the person. Um, and that's, of course, you know, common to therapy in general. And so a good relationship is defined the same way as it is in, in, in therapy generally, like trust, collaboration, warmth, mutual respect. And that like overrides any other consideration. Um, so, you know, cognitive therapy for psychosis, probably compared to other forms of CBT that you might have learned, emphasizes being friendly and flexible and collaborative. Um, so if anything you're doing as part of assessment or any other part of the process seems to be interfering with your relationship, just back off. Um, do something else, you know, talk about something that a person enjoys talking about for a while, or um, maybe if you notice you said something specific that upset the person, you know, really apologize. In earlier sessions, there might not be very much structure, and it might be impossible to uh, explicitly set an agenda. The key thing, though, is establishing that communication between equals, you know, even if the content's going all over the place. And, it's important not to get me wrong here because cognitive therapy really values structure very highly. But the thing is, the relationship trumps structure anytime. Relationships are foundation. If you don't have that, your structure is worthless. Um, so, one way you can kind of like work towards a friendly relationship is, is to regularly use what's called the disarming technique. And that's where you find something of value, something that's true and understandable and, and what the client's saying, um, no matter how illogical or distorted or unreasonable most of what they're saying sounds. So that kind of method's actually useful in a lot of situations. Like if you've never tried it with your spouse, you know, you might want to try that. Um, because usually even when people are saying something that we totally disagree with, there's at least something in what they're saying that we could go, yeah, I can really see where where you're coming from and, and, and relate to. And, um, and, and so that helps build a sense, oh yeah, this person's listening to me and they're open to being influenced by me. And, and that's really important. Incidentally, a lot of the research on cognitive therapy for psychosis compared it with an intervention where um, a, a, it's just sort of a befriending kind of therapy where a therapist just met and was just friendly with the person. And just meeting and being friendly with the person also had pretty large positive effects, but they didn't last in the way cognitive therapy did. Um, so cognitive therapy tries to go beyond just being a friendly relationship, but you have to start with the friendly relationship. That's, that's your, your base. Um, so one of the ideas is that you're not playing the role of an expert on what's going on with the person. You're not being a know-it-all. You're not. You know, you're not the master of reality who tells the client what reality is. So as part of that, you don't insist that the client conceptualize their problem as a mental illness. Um, and it's, and you also, it's not good to try to combine cognitive therapy with what's typically been medical model psychoeducation, where you do tell the client they have a mental illness. I'm going to talk about that more when we get to the section called formulation. Um, so, the, the, I guess we got a question there. Is it okay if I ask a question at any time? Um, well, right now it's okay. Well, I was just wondering, does, uh, does cognitive therapy only uh, 
work in the context of the relationship between a patient and a, and a therapist, or could like a, could a uh, consumer just kind of start reading books and do it on their own? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, a lot of this stuff is something that a person could just do on their own. There's one, there's a couple of books now that are out on the table there that are actually written more for consumers to read and, and to use some of the methods. They can use them by themselves or in conjunction with therapy. It might be a little more effective. But yeah, it's like cognitive therapy in general um, has methods and ideas that people can just do. Or if a person is working as on a peer support level, you know, they can just a lot of the ideas are just things that people can share. You know, therapy is just a more structured way of going about it. Um, so, um, so, yeah, some of the other basic components of this kind of therapy is you don't want to focus on what the therapist wants from the therapy or the therapist's idea of what improvement is. The goal is to be structured about what the around what the client wants. So, like. A therapist might think, okay, what would be good for this person is to get rid of their delusional belief. Um, but the client's goal might be more like, you know, I'm miserable because I'm just sitting home all the time and uh, it's too dangerous to go outside because the mafia is always watching me. Well, so if you're negotiating around that, you know, like, I had a client that had this idea that there was this vast network of people in the world that were all kind of conspired against him. And his life was pretty restricted because of that. So I kind of like noticed to him that his life seemed really restricted, and he was upset with that. And so I proposed that we evaluate his belief about this network, and that was too much for him. I mean, he was not open to considering that this conspiracy didn't exist. But what he was open to was he did notice he was too preoccupied with that conspiracy. It was like ruining, even when he was away from him in his home in a rural location, he was still worried about him all the time. So that's what he wanted to work on. And so that really gave us a place. That goal was still big enough for us to do cognitive work. Um, and, and we could look at how he calculated, how threatened he was, and that kind of stuff, and really start doing cognitive work. So you might want to make like a list of the problems the person wants to work on. Or if the person doesn't have a clear sense of what they want to work on, you can just talk about it. Well, let's have just a discussion about what's going on in your life, and, and maybe we'll come up with some things to change and, and see what can be done about it. Now, what you often have to do is kind of like suspend your disbelief and really focus on getting to know the person's experience. So a basic idea in, in this kind of therapy is, is collaborative empiricism. It's kind of a big word, but it means being open to looking at the evidence that the client brings in about their beliefs. So if they believe in alien abductions and think it's proven by something on the internet, maybe be willing to look that up on the internet and see what's there. Um, it's, it's important to be open to having all your beliefs questioned um, as part of the therapy, because it, you want to be really be taking an open-minded look at all the evidence, including that that's totally contrary to what you usually think. So that a, a, a basic principle is guided discovery. You know, the person, the client's discovering things for themselves using a process that's stimulated by the dialogue. And what they, what's come up when you do that process might be things that you didn't anticipate and they didn't anticipate. So it's a, it's a discovery process. And in, in doing that process, I alluded to this in uh, answering a question, that you're aiming for this middle ground between confrontation, which damages relationships, and collusion, which tends to reinforce um, a person's belief. So an example might be the client comes in and says, you know, those guys in the white van followed me here again today. They pretended to just drive right past, but I know they're waiting for me near here somewhere. And an example of a response that might be more like a collusion would be, like, wow, that must really upset you when they, when, when they do that. I understand why you don't go out very much. Confrontation might be more like, you know, wait a minute, you're not important enough for people to be following you around. What, what makes you think, you know, that anybody's interested in you? Wouldn't exactly help the relationship. Um, a better response might just be more like, it sounds like you're really upset. Can you 
tell me more about exactly what you noticed and how you decided what it meant? It becomes more of an exploration, you're curious. And in doing that, you want to avoid um, telling the client what to think. Um, Cognitive therapy uses this idea called Socratic dialogue, which is basically where you ask questions to get the client thinking about things. So you're asking questions that the client either has the knowledge to answer or they could get access to such knowledge. And, it, and you're drawing attention to relevant issues that might be outside of their, their current focus. So in the case when the person has beliefs that you think you know, could be diluted, it's about drawing out their doubt about it. It's not forcing them to face your doubt. So it's getting them curious about what's going on. And, um, and, and so you want to ask questions that get them to look at the counter evidence, not with you arguing the counter evidence. And what the client sees as counter evidence might be different than what you think. Um, when, you know, like, if you ask a client what's, um, let's say they have this belief, I've completely failed my parents. And you ask them what counter evidence to that might be. It might be really different than what you would think, but it's what's personally as meaningful to them is what's important. This, so this kind of work where you're not sort of like playing the authority is it's also similar to work if any of you've done motivational interviewing and, and that sort of thing. You're just more willing to look at pros and cons and that stuff. Um, yeah, okay. Kind of a specific question. In the, in the context of the exploration, like with the white man example, uh, is it safe to ask something like, well, what, if you, you um, think that they're following you, what do you think is their motivation? Why would they want to do that? Well, yeah, that's an exploring question. Sure, that would be great. Yeah. But that's not fueling the, the uh, thought. System. Yeah, the idea in cognitive therapy is that exploring is not fueling. Okay. Um, what really fuels is this collusion. Um, and they are following it. And a lot of, yeah, and sometimes actually just not talking about the belief, clients take as meaning confirmation of the belief. You come in and say, yeah, the aliens are all over and they're just, you know, beaming rays at me, and you just kind of like shut up about it and say, well, are you still keeping your rent up, you know, and stuff like that. And you, the client takes it to mean, yeah, they know about the aliens too, that, you know, they're just not going to do anything about it. Um, so, what this is about is trying to get the person thinking about it more so that you're trying to draw out the client's own rationality. You're trying to get them looking at both sides of the issue. Um, and that's often very difficult. It, it's really, it's one big time it's really difficult is when we think we have the evidence that would disprove their troublesome belief once and for all. And the temptation is to just tell it to them. That'll convince them. And sometimes, it even works in the moment, you know, the client goes, yeah, yeah, you must be right. But then like they did for one therapist, the client comes in at the next session and says, well, are we just going to argue about my beliefs again like we did last session? Um, it's just, you don't get much buy-in that way. And when re relationship breaks down, it's, it's typically because the, the client starts thinking that the therapist just wants to convince them of something and isn't really interested in exploring so it's usually the therapist trying too hard. You try too hard and you think you're going to convince somebody, but really um, you just alienate the person and lose the relationship. So you really want to show the interest in the ways that the client has already kind of like struggled to make sense of what happens to them and acknowledge the work they did to make um, sense of what's going on. And then also explore the connection between the sense they made of what was going on and the beliefs they came up with, and then the emotional and the behavioral consequences of having that belief. So it all might seem kind of incomprehensible at first. You know, what the heck's going on? What are they talking about? But if you just kind of hang in there, you eventually often make more sense of it. Um, and even when they don't seem to be making much sense, you can focus in on little bits of sense that you do catch in what they, they say. And that's kind of like part of the disarming technique. You're showing you're willing to receive something from them. You're willing to hear something in what they're saying and be able to affirm it. And um, by showing that you're open to being influenced by them, you're making them more interested in being influenced by you. Because none of us like to be influenced by somebody that we don't have any influence. 
Um, empathy is also important in this kind of work, even though it can be difficult at times. You know, you might not have had anything like the experience of what the client's saying, but you can still try to relate to what it seems to mean to them. And another thing about empathy is that it's important to keep empathy for the client's experience even when they themselves lose empathy for their own experience. Like I had a client who, had, when he was, you know, more fully psychotic, he'd imagine that he was just this heroic figure who was saving society from these extreme villains and killers. And now he's very embarrassed that he'd ever believed that or felt that way. Um, but we were able to kind of like look at how he felt overwhelmed at that point in his life and he kind of like reverted to a way of feeling good about himself that had worked when he was a child and, and felt overwhelmed as his family was in chaos and stuff. And so just being able to empathize with how he could have felt that way um, helped him develop empathy for himself. And that helped him then relate to what had gone on and what he could learn from it. Um, so you often have to have kind of like persistence and looking for sense in what's going on even when you can't see it right away. And that means really being able to sit with your confusion about what's happening without kind of like um, making excuses for your lack of understanding by jumping to medical model sorts of explanations. I mean, medical model sorts of explanations make it obvious why you don't understand what the client's saying. The client's just non-understandable. They have a brain disease. Um, but what's really important in, in, in all kinds of therapy is to just explore what's going on until the client does make sense to you. That's part of what really good therapy is. And it may be more challenging when a person initially makes less sense, but it's still really important. Uh, yeah? What about the um, metaphor thing? When someone's delusional, maybe they're using it, it's a metaphor that they're taking it literally. Uh, are you going to talk about that? I mean, is that something that's totally off? No, I'll be talking about that. Okay. Yeah, that's an important thing. Yeah. Because that's part of um, understanding it, is that maybe. <laughs> Uh, the person, if you took their words literally, it wouldn't make any sense at all, but if you take them more metaphorically, you can see, oh yeah, that kind of does make sense. Um, so self-disclosure, and um, a lot of people are taught different things about self-disclosure, but particularly in cognitive therapy for psychosis, self-disclosure is considered important. And, and part of the reason is because of the extreme um, imbalance between the person comes in and has had psychotic symptoms feels really alienated from everybody else. And so if, if you um, can talk to the person about having at least some experiences that are kind of far out or quirky or whatever, it helps make the person feel like they're, they're in common terms with you as a human being that um, has had, you know, that we we all have kind of like strange experiences. Now you might have never had anything nowhere, anywhere near as far out as what your client has, but just talking about that you've had some um, can really help do what's called normalizing, which we're going to talk more about later. It's a key part of cognitive therapy. So some advantages of what you might disclose, you know, like you might have worried at times that certain people are against you. That's very common. Or, you know, you might have had struggled where you, where you got into kind of like berating yourself in a way that seemed kind of out of control, and that might kind of like have some parallels with somebody who has a voice that kind of berates them. Or um, maybe you've had experiences when your mind went blank when someone asked you a question, and that might kind of relate to someone who feels like something's pulling thoughts out of their mind. Um, or even some experience you had while under the influence of some kind of substance. You know, some of us have had. Uh, uh, but all of this can kind of like um, help the client feel like, oh yeah, I'm not the only one who is a little out there sometimes. That it's part of being human and is possibly understandable. Okay, one more person that we're going to move on. I'll just say this out loud. There's a little truism that every now and then it clicks into my head when I'm starting to tell people reality. And it is, you never change a thought system by confronting or attacking the thought system. And that has borne itself to be true in my experience, and I think it also has been validated in the literature. And that helps me, it will pop into my head. You never change a thought system 
by attacking a thought system. Good. Yeah. It's, it's definitely true at a certain point where a person will dig in, and that's often more true with people that are having uh, psychotic symptoms is they'll just flip to thinking that you're just kind of like the enemy and just need to shut you out and stick, stick up for their own beliefs and you would kind of lose that relationship. So I want to move along to talking about uh, a key cognitive therapy for psychosis method that's called normalizing. Um, and normalizing explanations are used throughout uh, cognitive therapies starting with the assessment phase. Um, and basically, normalizing explanations look at what's going on, look at what we call psychotic symptoms as being just more extreme versions of things that we all struggle with. Um, so these kind of explanations see psychotic symptoms in terms that presume that they could happen to anybody given a certain sequence of events. And that whole approach kind of contradicts the notion that only a certain type of person could have a psychotic experience. Um, now, what we typically see is that people that, um, well, well, first I, I should say that the purpose of normalizing is to help the person come up with explanations for their experiences which are both kind of culturally acceptable and also put them at ease. Um, now, most people that have um, experienced psychosis um, they do one of two things. They either interpret the experience positively, they interpret the psychotic experience positively, which results in increased um, positive arousal and preoccupation <laughs> with the experience, or more likely they interpret it as some kind of uh, really negative thing or impending catastrophe. And that increases their negative arousal, and that also increases preoccupation with the experience. What the mental health system often does is come in and tells people, you know, no, it's not what you think it is, it's just mental illness. But that interpretation is also very scary. And, and it can be part of a cycle that increases that emotional arousal and then causes more symptoms. Because the person is kind of like really upset about what's happening, that being upset leads to more psychotic symptoms. It's kind of interesting that the fear of going mad is a key problem both for people that develop post-traumatic stress disorder and for people that develop uh, psychosis. Um, it's, it's found that the people that have the most fears of going mad are the people that tend to then develop the most symptoms. And it's also true that people that are trauma survivors are, have been found to be likely to be way more traumatized by having psychotic <coughs> symptoms. They're kind of like, you know, sensitized to trauma. So, um, in this um, little diagram here, you can see how, um, you know, you start out at the top, you have some kind of stress, and then whatever happens after stress, the person starts hearing a voice. Um, and then it's the interpretation of the voice. You know, if the person interprets the voice as a threat, it's a very threatening experience somehow, then that sets off a sequence where the perception of threat increases negative mood, and then the sense of being threatened by the voice and having negative mood can lead to hypervigilance for more voices, listening harder to them, which then in increases stress and increases the hearing of the voice. So that it's an example of a vicious circle um, that can be um, caused by a particular interpretation. Now, one theory of, of psychosis is that people in many situations experience the equivalent of psychosis but they just blame the situation. You know, they blame, well, it's those drugs I took, or the fact that I haven't gotten any sleep, or it's the fact I'm just under extreme stress in my life right now. And so they normalize the experience of themselves, and it doesn't become anything. They hear the voice and say, well, gee, I'm under way too much stress. I better just take a break. And maybe they don't worry too much about it, and the voice fades away. Studies basically show that for every person that gets treated for psychotic symptoms about 10 times, that many people have some kind of psychotic experience. It, it, it could be that not having it normalized um, is what leads to it being an, more of an ongoing problem. So the idea is that you normalize but don't minimize. I mean, if, you know, somebody's really um, <coughs> may, may need to take appropriate action to take care of themselves, like 
you know, actually get that sleep or stop their drug use or lower their stress or whatever. Um, but um, I'll throw out a few examples of, of normalizing explanations and how they work. Like within cognitive therapy, um, we use a, you know, the concept of automatic thoughts. And so cognitive therapists will talk about how weird automatic thoughts can be. It's just automatic thoughts are just thoughts that just kind of spontaneously pop into your brain. Now, one thing that's real common in people that get diagnosed with psychosis is that they have a hard time owning their thoughts. Um, they often you know, get very upset with their thoughts to the point of disowning them. Like, that's so stupid or evil, it couldn't be me thinking it. And so they, the person might decide that something's putting thoughts into their head or that they, they start hearing it more as a voice instead of um, as part of themselves. So the cognitive therapy approach is just to focus on how there's really nothing stranger than the thoughts that go through our minds. And that's true for all of us. And I've you know, used examples of some of my own stranger thoughts and images and asked how I would know if somebody else put them into my mind. Uh, another example of normalizing is educating about the kind of experiences that are typically associated with panic and anxiety. Like one example is a client of mine who thought he was being attacked by voodoo and he was going to die from it. And he had, he had beliefs on, like, well, I don't have panic. I don't have anything like that. And so even though he was in a really high-stress situation, he wasn't, he wasn't able to acknowledge to himself that he was having any kind of stress or fear because he just didn't acknowledge that to himself. And instead, what he was having is, is basically the freeze response where he would feel kind of immobilized, like he couldn't move felt like he was going to die and had lots of symptoms around his heart. But educating around panic provided a normalizing alternative explanation of how panic works in people and the kind of things people typically feel. I didn't have to tell them it was panic, but just telling them that that is what was a common experience. Um, gave them some alternative uh, to the way he was looking at it. Um, so normalizing basically uses the idea of a continuum of experience that, um, you know, it's, it's normal to have various kinds of reactions when we're under stress. And the worst stress we're under, you know, the stranger kind of things that might, experiences that might emerge. And it's very different than the notion that there's a decisive separation between the same here and the insane here. And by the way, the research doesn't show any kind of discontinuities between those two camps. It shows more like a, a graduation of different kinds of experiences with no clear dividing line. Um, so there's no clear dividing line between the different diagnostic categories, and there's no clear dividing line between people who are diagnosable and not. So the notion of a continuum is much more scientific than the notion of discrete categories as well. Um, and it also allows people to conceptualize crossing over. Like if I'm in a category called insane, the sane are way over here, it's really hard to imagine how I'm going to jump from one to the other. But if, if it's all a matter of, well, some people have more extreme experiences and I'm kind of on the extreme here, there's a sense I can gradually move along that continuum, be a little less extreme and have a little bit less of a problem and gradually, you know, um, get over whatever the issue is. So. Now, clients themselves will often use language which exaggerates their difference from the rest of us. Like, how many of you have ever felt something like a separate spirit or demon inside of you that wanted to do something different from what you wanted to do and, and tried to take over your body? Okay, one, two. Okay, so how many of you have ever tried to go on a diet but then had to struggle with some kind of impulse inside you that wanted chocolate cake? <laughs> Okay, so it's really the same kind of thing, but noticing that is part of normalizing. Noticing that, you know, even though the client's using this really extreme language, which, you know, sounds psychotic or whatever, they're really talking about fundamentally a kind of human experience that we all have. Um, and, and while, you know, some people might say, well, the client's exaggeration of their difference between themselves and others is part of their delusional system or mental illness, it's interesting that the mental health system does the same thing. It also tends to exaggerate the difference between people that are diagnosed and not diagnosed. And, and we could call that kind of abnormalization that happens. It's like, 
one way we distance ourselves from people who are diagnosed is to talk about their behavior in terms of symptom categories while we use uh, different names for our own similar behavior. <laughs> like, compare how, you, how we hear people talk about someone who hears a voice, let's say, that's criticizing them, and, uh, and then how we talk about just the average person who's maybe thinking things over and having some self-critical thoughts. They might be having very similar experiences, but the person, we'd only say that one of them is attending to internal stimuli. You guys heard that phrase? Even though really they both are. They're both attending to internal stimuli, what's going on inside them. And we ordinarily wouldn't notice the, all the similarities between our own self-critical thoughts and the person who's um, hearing voices. But normalization is about noticing those similarities and putting them on a continuum. You know, like, you know, oh, I, I don't usually feel my self-critical thoughts as a voice, but they do get really pretty out of hand sometimes if I'm stressed, you know. We talk about that. Now, one reason why many people, including mental health professionals, exaggerate the differences between themselves and the, those who are diagnosed mentally ill is that it helps us kind of like disown or project our own mental vulnerability onto other people. You know, that we can kind of like feel like, well, we're not vulnerable to those kind of catastrophic mental mistakes. It's, it's just those people over there. Um, but the problem is that kind of like dehumanizes the diagnosed person. It makes it harder for that person to see themselves as someone who's able to recover because, you know, how, how can I ever get rid of this, these patterns I'm having? Um, but it elevates those who are not diagnosed as to being a little bit more sane than what we really are. You know, we have all kinds of internal stimuli also, and internal conflicts. And, um, and it, it also makes it harder for us to listen um, when people who are diagnosed actually do have something helpful to say, because we've put them in such a separate category that we're not really listening to them as much. You know, it's, it's been said that a mark of maturity in mental health is to be able to tolerate ambiguity and to be able to... This, this thing I'm talking about is to see the world with less of a dividing line between sane and the insane, or their experience and our experience. It involves a toleration of um, that kind of ambiguity. Um, but it's, it is where we need to go, and it, uh, it is what a key part of uh, this kind of cognitive kind of therapy approach. So, um, I wonder if people have questions about this particular section. I don't have a question. I just want to appreciate what you just said because I think that's uh, one of the big risks of this profession is arrogance. And what you said is, is so true, I believe. I've often wondered who's, who is the real therapist in the sense that I'm learning more from the client, perhaps, than they are learning from me. I just want to say thank you. And thanks for your comment. I mean, I think that the central point that uh, it's important not to be arrogant is really key to this kind of approach. Um, it's, in order to be collaborative, you've got to like kind of like dump your role as a you know expert and all, all that, and, and be open to the idea that you have maybe some things to offer, but you've only got part of the picture. And, um, and so to develop a fuller picture, you really need to uh, collaborate with the other person and see them as a fellow human being, and um, and acknowledge there's a lot going on inside them that's uh, strengthened and healthy along with whatever kind of problem they've got. Yeah. Let me just share something. Years back when I took my first position at Rancho Los Angeles Hospital, that, that had a lot of the most you know, skilled neurologists from UCLA there and showed their humility. They had an in-house diagnosis, it wasn't in any DSM, but they used to call it Gork. God only really knows. He, some of the cases that they had run into, they simply did not know or had an answer. Huh? Right. And yeah. it was, everyone accepted it. So that's the opposite of a joke I heard when I was in a conference um, recently, which is somebody's 
who'd been a, in a mental hospital, they were saying, yeah, you meet all kinds of people when you go into a mental hospital, and they have all kinds of weird beliefs. He said, the, the first person that I ran into thought he was God, but it turned out that was just a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the approach you don't want to take. <laughs> Well, maybe it's a good time to have a break. Functionality. 
Well, it, there, there might be various ways to change what's being discussed or how it's being discussed. Um, that's what I would do. I mean, if, I, I think that's true in general in, in therapy is that if what you're doing isn't working, try something else. Um, one thing that is really important, I think, is for us as therapists to become more outcome informed so that we tailor what we're doing to a specific person. And that's kind of the opposite of what Bill O'Hanlon talked about when he first got into therapy. He said back then what seemed to be going on is everybody would learn a certain method in graduate school, and then you would go out and try that on somebody, and if it didn't work, you would say that the client was being resistant. And, uh, and his idea was, no, that's not it. It means you need to try something different. It's not working with that person. It doesn't even mean what you're doing isn't in general a good idea, but it means it didn't work for that person, and you should try something different. So you find something that works. Uh, Okay, so maybe I'll just um, move into the next section, which is what we're going to be talking about. This is a real key uh, part of cognitive therapy for psychosis in particular, and that's called developing a formulation. And that's basically a working hypothesis um, about the story or the overview of what's going on with the psych psychosis. So it covers both what caused the problem and what maintains the problem. And, and by doing that, it provides both hope and suggestions about what to do, because if you have a sense of what's um, created and maintaining the problem, you start having a sense of what, what could possibly change to make something go different. Now, in the traditional mental health system approach, it doesn't really give people much of a story, and so there isn't really much hope. You know, in the traditional mental health system, there's a big deal is made of trying to convince clients that their experiences are caused by their illness, such as schizophrenia. And cognitive therapists see that as kind of useless. It's basically, if you look at this diagram, it's like the client is asking, what's causing these weird experiences? And as a mental health worker, you're saying, well, they're caused by your illness, which is schizophrenia. Then if the client asks, well, how do I know that I have this illness? We say, well, you have these weird experiences. <laughs> um, it's, it's just circular. I mean, it pretends to say something, but it really doesn't. And so that's one reason why cognitive therapists don't insist that clients think of themselves as having any kind of particular mental illness. Um, it just tries to get them to look at, well, what the heck is actually going on? I mean, people often imagine that we know something about a medical cause. And so this is often kind of like, what's imagined that, we, that is going on, that there's some kind of um, biological thing that happens that leads to pathological anatomy, and then that pathological anatomy leads to the various symptoms. Now, one thing you notice about this is that it's linear. Um, also, there's no medical test for schizophrenia, and so it's really just a theory. And another thing about it, it says provides absolutely no role for the client in taking responsibility for health or recovery. As, as Rufus May puts it, um, it leaves a person feeling like a passive victim of an active illness. So the person is passive and the illness is active. The client's only responsibility within the medical model is to have insight into their illness, to acknowledge themselves as ill, and to take pills as prescribed. <laughs> Um, so what you're trying to do with the formulation, this formulation actually discourages client attempts to regain control over symptoms by other than medical means, because it just sees the symptoms as just resulting from their defective um, brain. I mean, and how is a client supposed to stop a disease process or anatomical defects? But then what happens when the pills don't work? Where, where is the client supposed to get help then when they're already on seven pills and they're not working? Um, now, um, United Kingdom psychiatrist Phil Thomas used this slide to illustrate the essential message of the medical model. It's not exactly recovery-oriented. Um, it's from Dante's Inferno. Um, now, Sometimes people try to mix medical model psychoeducation with cognitive therapy and recovery-oriented language, as does the method called illness management and recovery, which some of you might have heard of. But this is, this is language from one of their official handouts that are used in illness management and recovery method. 
And it's basically saying, schizophrenia is nobody's fault. This means you did not cause the disorder, neither did your family members or anyone else. Scientists believe that the symptoms of schizophrenia are caused by a biochemical imbalance in the brain. It basically prevents just, presents just one view of uh, psychosis and schizophrenia in a very dogmatic fashion. But if you present something this way, you're really losing one of the most important elements of, of cognitive therapy. Because essentially you're saying to the person, you know, I know your experience is caused by a brain, brain disease or biochemical imbalance. Now let's have an open-minded discussion about what's going on. Um, I mean, it's inconsistent and ineffective. And it's, it's also uh, teaching people stuff like this is teaching things contrary to what we actually know about the origins of psychosis. Because we actually know that people's experiences and decisions can actually play a major role in what goes on. If, and now some people are, feel like they're put in a role where they have to do medical model psychoeducation for their job or they have colleagues that do it and they don't want to get in too much confrontation with their colleagues. So one thing you can do if, if you have to present the medical model approach is just present it as what some people think while freely engaging and looking at both the evidence for that model and the evidence against it and asking you know, the client, well, what do you make of it? So that way you're, you might still present the information, but you're not taking the role of being a know-it-all. Now, one of the advantages of the medical model, at least in many people's imagination, is that it relieves the client of being blamed uh, for being bad for having their problem. But the problem is it goes too far to the opposite extreme. So on, on one extreme, it's misspelled shame, that's supposed to be shame and blame model. Um, <coughs> But kind of like where you must have chosen to become like this, it be better if you want to, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So that's kind of like one extreme. But the medical model is basically on the other extreme. You know, you aren't responsible, your thoughts and decisions play no role whatsoever in this. Um, the cognitive approach is a little bit more in the middle. It, it doesn't blame people for having to run into problems. It acknowledges they didn't anticipate it, they didn't plan to, you know, have their problem. But it gives them a role with, with some effort and with some help. You might learn how to get out of this. Um, so in this case, you can see, just like our clients often go to extremes, um, often the mental health system also goes to extremes. You know, it, 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 it's basically taking an extreme approach over here, but it's often not recognized as an extreme. So what you're trying to do in cognitive therapy is give more of a role to the client or the consumer, so that they can gradually take on responsibility for what's going on. Within cognitive therapy, there's an idea that the person eventually learns how to do whatever the therapist was doing for them. So in a, in a sense, eventually becomes uh, his or her own therapist. Now another interesting thing is that people often think that the medical model approach is going to reduce stigma. Um, by, by making people see clients as less responsible for their behavior. But research shows that it actually makes people, and including mental health workers, see clients as, as less predictable, to see them as more dangerous, and it increases desire for social distance from them. So it basically increases the key components of stigma when you teach people the medical model. And clients themselves feel more helpless when they're taught that model. And, and research also says that when people do recover, they typically credit a relationship with someone who believed in them and in their potential. And so the cognitive approach aims to help both the therapist and the client have a model of psychosis that explicitly includes the possibility of recovery. Um, and so getting back to the cognitive therapy formulation, it's basically it's an individualized story. I mean, it usually covers a lot of different factors. Um, so it, it, it covers, uh, actually, you can remember, here it's listed as the three P's, but there's actually four P's, if you want to try to remember these. There's what set the person up to become vulnerable to psychotic symptoms, which, in other words, the predisposing factors. And uh, here they've listed both biological, psychological, and social. And under biological, you might know what they included a, a possible genetic predisposition. Because until we have a genetic test, um, which there certainly isn't 
Um, we don't really know whether somebody has, is genetically predisposed um, to having psychosis, but that's anyway just one of a whole number of factors. And then there's what tipped the person actually into their first psychotic episode, um, or their current one, whatever it is. So that's the precipitating factors. Um, for this person, include everything from alcohol, physical illness, depression, you know, death of mother, social isolation, a lot of different things that happened around the time when the person got tipped into psychosis. But then what kept the symptoms going once they got started? That's the perpetuating factors. And then finally, there's what kept it from being worse than it actually was, or what were the protective factors. And those are important because they represent the already existing strengths of the person, and that's something you can build on in recovery when you look at why it didn't get worse than it did. So without a formulation or a story, the therapy is likely to lack direction. Um, and, and, and it's not like a fixed story that you come up with, but it's a flexible starting point. You start thinking, well, gee, maybe, you know, not going out is somehow contributing to perpetuating it. So we could experiment with going out more, you know. Maybe you need better ways to deal with anxiety. Maybe, you know, something about the chronic pain, a better way to deal with that would help. If we're going to, you know, if somebody has a psychotic episode and then they need to learn how to retrust their brain, um, you really need a story of what went wrong and of why to expect that that's not going to happen again. And because the formulation describes like a chain of events that causes psychosis, the client can start seeing, well, the possibility of breaking that chain in order uh, to end it and, and prevent uh, the psychosis from coming back. Uh, we do have somebody that wants to ask a question. Yeah, here. but it's kind of a general question. Um, it's kind of a general question. There's no mention of economic factors, and when you've been going through the research and the, the various, you know, kind of uh, population, what we know about the population, is there any kind of economic um, part of when you are to find the psychotic or whether, you know, how it interacts relates to these other biological, psychological, social? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if they, you know, I have no idea what, um, in a particular person's case, that may be more important than others. But yeah, generally, it is a big, a big factor that uh, even if, one of the biggest uh, things that you look at overall patterns of when people do better recovering from schizophrenia is when the economy is doing better and there's more jobs available. So um, it definitely is a factor. I mean, there's a lot of different factors, and you try to pick out what's relevant for the particular client you're dealing with, and it's, it's a working hypothesis, so at first you might leave something out and then realize, hey, that's important, we better put that in there. Um, and it's, and like I say, it's individualized. So what you're really trying to do is follow something in cognitive therapy, they call it the principle of coherence between past experience and then the schema or beliefs that the person comes out as a result of their experience, and then the psychotic experience itself. And that kind of like, that sense that there's a coherence between all that is what guides you in developing the formulation. And if you really can see things in terms of that coherence, you can kind of like see how it could actually be even perfectly normal to, to go mad given the right chain of events. Um, the formulations generally follow the, the vulnerability stress model, which most of you have probably heard of before. And that's a model that says that when people are highly vulnerable, just a little stress can push them over the edge into psychosis. But if people are less vulnerable, they can still be pushed over the edge by major stress. Now within cognitive therapy, um, we, we conceptualize vulnerability as not just being biological. Uh, in some ways, the vulnerability stress model was hijacked. And we're looking at vulnerability as just biological, but it was originally proposed that vulnerability could include a lot of things. So vulnerability might include the fact the person was sexually abused when they were young. It might include various beliefs that they came up with about how to cope in the world. Um, it might have to do with problems in the person's support system. And so, um, you know, you can see how, like, having unresolved trauma can lead people to react poorly to future stressors and then get re-traumatized. Um, so that's just one example of, 
how stress really varies depending on how vulnerable we are to it in various ways. And it's also stress varies a lot by how much we hold on to things. You know, there's a reason why stress is a verb about am I stressing over this or something like that. Because I, I think probably a lot of you have had the experience where you were really stressing about something and then at a certain point you just gave up trying to control it and let your stress go down. Um, but typically people who uh, have getting into problems with psychosis aren't very good at like letting go of, 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 of stressful stuff and then they instead go to some kind of extreme with it and then maybe they let go too much they just give up trying everything or something like that and go to the opposite extreme uh, and that can create a lot of negative symptoms that we'll talk about later. Now, medication is basically one reason they work from the perspective of cognitive therapy is they help people let go of stress and not stress so much. I mean, in, in some sense, they can be looked at as indifference pills. But they can also get a person into being too indifferent as well. So vulnerability can include, you know, something like genetic vulnerability or, uh, you know, something like that. But since it's, we don't really know that, those are always just conjectural. Well, you might have, you might be a little more vulnerable in a genetic way. Um, or um, there's... But a lot of what, what's looked at within cognitive therapy is that vulnerability can grow or shrink over time, um, depending on the course of events, depending on the way a person who learns to cope differently or a person who builds a better support system, their vulnerability is going to go down. And beliefs also are a key part of vulnerability. Like a person who has a belief like, I'm bad, uh, can add to vulnerability. Or in order to be lovable, I must be perfect. Or distrusting everyone keeps me safe. You know, those kind of beliefs can all add to a vulnerability to psychosis. So, but then also as you work with them, um, you can work on changing some of those beliefs and make a person uh, less vulnerable. So, one thing that cognitive therapists do when they're working on these formulations is try to kind of like um, boil things down in some ways into you know, uh, a simple overall outline, or, or often they're fond of graphs. Um, and this is an example of um, Morrison's model of psychosis, put as it said into uh, client-friendly language. Um, but one thing I was going to say about when you do come up with a formulation, it's often tempting to try to make them really complex. <coughs> Even this one is too complex for some people. But what you really want instead is something that's relatively simple, that, so that it's very understandable to the client and it translates well into action and uses their own terminology whenever possible. So this is just an example of a kind of a, a way of like using this rough outline you can get a lot of the key factors on. Like what are the person's life experiences? How did that lead to various beliefs and way of making sense of things? What's going on now that is kind of like, the, seems to be like the the intrusion or the, the symptom or whatever, and what does the person do when that happens, and how do they feel, and then how all those interrelate. You could draw more arrows on here than what there are, but you can see how all these things interrelate with each other. Um, so, cognitive therapists are interested in looking at the catastrophic interaction between various factors that, if taken alone, might not have led to psychosis. So often, if certain things had happened just by themselves, that wouldn't have tipped somebody into psychosis. But because there's an interaction between different things, um, the psychosis develops. And using a diagram like this can help catch those kind of interactions. Um, so this is an example of it applied for a particular person. And so um, you've got a person whose life experience it includes like uh, having childhood physical abuse, having experienced various assault, prison sentences, and then somewhat understandably develop beliefs like I'm vulnerable, other people are dangerous, should be paranoid to keep on my toes. And they'll develop some hypervigilance and fear and paranoia that led to more of that. And, and then in that state of mind, you know, starts thinking, you know, there are people against me and seeing blue bands and imagining being stabbed. And then um, trying not to think about um, that, because using thought suppression to try not to think about it, but then 
one of the problems with thought suppression is often the more you try to suppress a thought, the more you have it. Uh, so that, that um, behavior down here actually leads to more of exactly what the person is trying to suppress. And, and of course, having that experience of feeling like there's a conspiracy just reinforces the idea that I'm vulnerable and I better be more paranoid, just stay on my toes to watch out. So you get some vicious circles going. And, and remember, um, I was saying how looking for those vicious circles is, is really important um, in trying to understand uh, what's going on. Often it's things that a person is trying to do to make things better. The person is trying to do things to keep them safe, but that's actually leading to, in this case, being paranoid and being overwhelmed by fear and paranoia. Um, so what the person is doing that they think is keeping them safe is actually making things worse. Um, and and that, because it has that vicious circle quality, it has the, the characteristics of a feedback loop. Now most of you know from hearing when somebody moves the microphone too close to a speaker, you get this kind of dreadful sound. We know where it comes from in that case. But what's going on when people get into these loops, these vicious circles, when they're developing psychosis, they don't understand where the problem is coming from. They don't understand how what they're doing is actually making it worse. And so that's kind of like the whole point of, of doing uh, this kind of a process of, of mapping it out what's happening is because then the person can start to see, oh yeah, I'm doing this and then this happens and then it gets worse. And if they start coming with the idea, well what if we did something different? And that becomes what you work on in the next part of therapy. Now, I said like this is like maybe pretty complex. Sometimes uh, this is an example of a formulation that was done with uh, a woman who was developmentally disabled. And what was going on with her is she'd been living with her brother, but he was being very abusive with her, and he was having his friends come over and forcing her to have sex with them. And then she started hearing voices that were saying things like, you're useless, you're a slut. And at this point, the, the drawing or the formulation was just to show her there's some connection between the distressing experiences and the voices she had, so she could see that, oh, yeah, it's not just that I'm psychotic and weird, it's that, you know, my brother did these things and, and it's kind of understandable. So, and you might be paying attention to different parts of the formulation at different times. Like in the beginning, you might be paying more attention to things that are more like perpetuating factors or trying to strengthen protective factors so that you can solve some immediate problem. And then later on, as you're working with the person, you might be focus more on understanding predisposing factors so that you can help a person work on becoming less vulnerable to psychosis in the future. But being able to see this in terms of a story really gives that person the sense that they could change something to reduce symptoms and then eventually to, to um, reduce their vulnerability. Um, when you're doing this kind of approach, it's also important to tune into what the client's ready for at any given time. Like the client, as they come in, they already have their own formulation of what's going on, or maybe they have a few competing ones. Like often the client has, they have their more psychotic formulation of what's going on. Oh yeah, it's all when the uh, CIA decided to start, you know, putting an implant in my head. That's when my problem started. And then maybe they've got an alternative formulation. Well, it's, um, you know, I just have a brain disease, um, a biochemical imbalance. But, so depending on what, where the client's at to start out with, um, if, you're, if, if what you start, if you, you would want to try to introduce something that feels too much like a confrontation. So you um, really try to focus on something that's at least somewhat new to the client, but not so contradictory that it's going to be rejected outright. So like the client, I mentioned that I believe that there was a huge plot against him, um, and he wasn't open to seeing that plot as, as being anything other than a real plot. But he was open to seeing, like, well, why am I so hypervigilant to this plot that I'm just like obsessing about it all the time? And he was willing to look at, well, gee, maybe that has something to do with my past trauma that happened to him. And, and, and so that gave us you know, somewhere to start, start working on. Um, so another kind of way that you can uh, lay out a formulation is what's called a developmental formulation. 
And that's kind of like laid out, where you lay out things that happened in a person's life, just kind of like one thing followed another, though often kind of like with more of a, a loop at some point where maybe um, a person did get into some kind of a vicious circle. So I'm going to illustrate one of those, um, but I'm going to try to do two things at once because I'm going to um, talk about my own story at the same time. Even though I'm not a person that ever um, got diagnosed with psychosis, um, I um, did have um, a lot of things that happened in my developmental history that kind of like shows how there could be a lot of stories that are on a continuum with those people who end up in the mental health system. And maybe not that much difference between some stories that turn out well and stories that don't. Uh, turn out so well, or at least for a while. So, um, as far as like what predisposed me, I mean, I grew up in a really large family where there was really a lot of abuse. Um, one of my brothers described it as kind of like growing up in a concentration camp. And my mother was really responsible for a lot of the abusiveness, but if you knew her story, you could understand that in a sense, I mean, here she's trying to raise uh, 10 boys and one girl with very little help from my dad. And, and she started out with, you know, bad beliefs about child raising, like child improvement through punishment and hostility and humiliation. You know, she didn't have very good concepts to start out with. So anyway, but for me, my experience was like, often it's being backed into a corner, berated, just really attempts to crush who I was. And when I went to school, I had such a crushed sense of self that I wasn't good at standing up to the other kids either, so I got bullied a lot. So I kind of like developed a real negative sense of myself and felt defined by others in a way that often kind of crushed my sense of hope. And so to, to get hope, I had to learn to be able to see myself the opposite of the way other people often see me, the opposite of the way I'd kind of been trained to see myself. And so I had learned as a kid kind of like to, to dissociate quite a bit to make some things more real in my mind and some things less real just so that I could kind of like emotionally survive. And as a teenager and young adult, I started experimenting with how to create my own identity and sense of who I was in the world. And I wasn't content, once I realized I could do that, I wasn't content to just be an okay person. You know, I developed kind of like grandiose goals and would reject reason completely. And um, Partly, you know, I can look back on it now and see, well, maybe I was overdoing it because deeper inside I still felt like I was this defective person. So to compensate, I had to be like, you know, way, way better than other people. Um, but the beliefs I developed were often like exaggerations of ones that other people in society held, only not quite so strongly. Like all of the hippies had the concept we create our own reality. It's very common, but but maybe they didn't make systematically recreating their reality into a, a, a real central preoccupation for them like it did for me. And one of my things was, focuses was on, on writing and creating new ways of, of seeing by, by thinking differently and writing differently. And I can still remember introducing my writing into one of my creative writing classes and having one student say, well, isn't this just mental illness? <laughs> Quite a few agreeing with them because it was just pretty weird and out there. I mean, it often alienated other people, sometimes because I just wanted to, I just didn't want to make sense the way they did. Other times I'd try to make sense and they couldn't relate to me. Um, but I didn't go far enough to get into the psychiatric system. I think that could have been really crushing. That could have led to this kind of loop here, because then all of a sudden I'd have a negative identity as a mental patient defined by others, and then if I tried to assert my own identity in there, which I probably would have gone even more extreme into my way of doing it, then um, I'd get defined with less as more symptoms, and it would be a very crushing, would have been a very crushing experience for me. Um, so what worked for me? Well, what were the protective factors? Well, one of them was that I was studying psychology at the same time, and I was familiar with some of the more radical stuff within psychology at the time, like R.D. Lang, Gregory Bateson, and so I had an idea of the, um, the approach that, gee, maybe being out there and psychotic isn't all just a, a, an illness, there's other aspects to it. And I was also studying various spiritual and creative traditions, and that helped me normalize what's going on. Okay, other people have gone through this, they've even got something good out of it. You know, I had a psychology teacher, I talked with quite a lot about what I was going through, and um, he 
you know, talked in quite a bit of detail. He saw me as one of the people on campus that was going through some sort of psychotic-like experience, but he didn't feel I needed help. Um, so he, he did believe in my potential, and that was really important. But what's really even more important was peers, um, support from uh, other people who could just uh, understand what I was going through, sometimes because they were going through similar kind of stuff. They were kind of on the edge. They were interested in breaking free of the culture's way of making meaning. And, um, you know, basically what my friends and I did together is we learned to be ways of being grandiose and strange in, in ways that worked, in ways that, you know, where we could make sense to each other and we could break a lot of the rules of the traditional culture, but we could be bizarre and get away with it. You might call this kind of like responsible creativity. Uh, one of my best friends from that time, his name is John Law, and uh, he was hospitalized for psychosis at one point when he was 17, but um, he became kind of like an expert in how to, how to do this, how to be bizarre and strange, but in a way, getting away with it, and he learned how to really be the public face for bizarre events. So like when Burning Man went to Nevada, it was John Law who was in charge of convincing the local sheriff that these weren't a bunch of Satanists with their 40-foot high man lit up by neon and stuff like that. Uh, and he was really good at that. I mean, he could kind of explain, he could normalize it to the sheriff. Well, they're just people from the city, you know, they kind of like to have a good time, just like you guys do, and they do a little differently, but, you know, no problem. Uh, <laughs> but this thing we did of asserting our identity in ways that were strange and bizarre isn't all that much different than what some of our some of the people that get diagnosed with psychosis do. Um, like one client of mine who at one point in his development would go out and do bizarre things in public on his own and later on the mental health system just defined that oh that's all part of the schizophrenia and he had become convinced that that was just a sign that he was ill. And um, even though he was inspired at the time by the same philosophy that we had when we went out and did our stuff. He was just braver and more foolish to go out and do it alone. And um, so a key problem is that often people in the mental health system don't understand the dynamics that might drive people um, towards some of these kind of things. They don't understand why people would want to be bizarre or on the edge because they haven't been. Often people in the mental health system, uh, especially in psychiatry, in order to get through medical school and all that, you've got to be kind of a conventional person. And so maybe it's hard to, harder to normalize people that are kind of like enjoy being out there or weird. Um, now, the kind of stuff I was going through, like whereas I never ran into problems with the mental health system, that five of eight of my younger siblings did run into major problems. That is either um, getting hospitalized or getting on SSI for mental disability or one of my brothers com committed suicide. And the things that they were going through were not um, like really independent or all that much different from what I went through. It's just they ran into rockier areas or they didn't get maybe the right kind of support or the right kind of connections at the right point to help them get through it in a positive way. Um, but, the, and then some of them have managed to make a recovery and some not at this point in time. But I think understanding that what's the central thing that's going on can be the same in a, in a lot of different stories really helps us see more of the potential in people and not see them as just as it be just being about an illness or disease, but being it about um, a life story that has a lot of the components that are true in, in a lot of people's life story. Now, often I think in the mental health system, we get people get caught between two extreme stories. Um, and you know, the young person maybe goes too far in trying to develop their own autonomy and point of view. And sometimes that can be because of trauma or whatever. But they get to where I have to believe this story for important emotional reason, even if it gets me in, in serious trouble. And so they're stick to their story that's seen as psychotic, uh, even when it's causing a lot of trouble. And the mental health system goes to the opposite side, the, the psychiatric story, where they want the person to believe that their experiences and beliefs are caused by a disease of schizophrenia. Whereas in cognitive therapy, what we're aiming at is more like an evolving human story. That uh, the person 
can develop their story of what they and how they put things and how they frame things in a way that allows them both to keep their self-respect and, and keep their creativity, but uh, also relating well to others, which is what we you know really want as people that can relate relate to others. But when people are caught between the psychotic story and the psychiatric story, it's like being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, you, there is no flexibility in there. So what we're trying to do in cognitive therapy is create a middle ground, um, a, a, a middle alternative. And by being non-dogmatic with people, they can kind of like start seeing, well, maybe I don't have to insist on my story exactly. Maybe I can allow that, okay, maybe what I was asserting was only partly true, or it was only one way of looking at it. Maybe it was kind of metaphorical, like somebody said before. It wasn't totally literally true. Um, but when, when you can do that, you're basically um, helping connect with people's humanity. You're helping them uh, sort out what's valid in their point of view, versus maybe where they're going off track somewhat, or maybe they've made a mistake, or they've exaggerated something. Um, but that's really the essential core of, of cognitive therapy for psychosis is, is helping support more of that, that kind of middle ground. Um, so I wonder if people have questions about this. Okay, we've got somebody back there. There's a microphone behind it. We talked about the value of diagnosis more or less, you know, importance given to the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So what's the role that you see for diagnosis? Are they needed? Are they um, I really don't see much of a role for diagnosis because I think what you do in the formulation is you really try to look uh, much more individualized at exactly what's going on. A diagnosis is a category. I often explain it's kind of like a filing category. The mental health system needs to put you in some particular category. That's just what they do. Now let's try to figure out what's really going on. And when you try to figure out what's really going on, you try to look at all the components of what might be going on with the person. And so, you know, um, that's, it's a much more complex and detailed kind of view than just like, oh, you fit into schizoaffective disorder. You know, instead you look at all the whole dynamics of it. Um, that's my take on diagnosis. 